Good afternoon. My name is Jonathan Barrick. I'm the Laurie Cross Lake of Professor at Stanford in Gynecologic Oncology and the director of the Stanford Women's Cancer Center. And it's my great pleasure and privilege to be here to introduce my colleague and friend and collaborator, uh, Ursula Madalonis, um, who's from the Dana-Farber, and I'll give you her uh, bio in just a minute. So welcome, and um, this is uh, Breakthroughs, the Stanford Cancer Institute Breakthroughs in Cancer Seminar. And um, we're happy to see all of you here today in person and all of those who are online. Our <clears throat> Breakthroughs in Cancer Seminar series is on the second Tuesday of each month at 4 p.m. with a reception to follow. We have one more seminar in 2023. The 2014 series will start January 8th, and speakers will be announced in November. The next seminar is October 10th with Dr. Jennifer Grandis from the University of San Francisco, and the seminar topic is Head and Neck Cancer Translational Medicine. Today's seminar format will be 40 to 45 minutes for, the t for uh, Dr. Madalona's talk, and then 10 to 15 minutes for Q&A. For our Zoom participants, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A box to submit them and we'll review them and hopefully we'll get to some of them at the end. So, Dr. Madalonis is the chief of the division of gynecologic oncology at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. She's the first recipient of the Brock Wilson Family Chair at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. She's co-leader of the gynecologic cancer program within the Dana-Farber Harvard Cancer Center and the Ovarian Cancer Specialized Program in Research Excellence, the SPORE grant from the National Cancer Institute. She's led several PARP inhibitor, anti-angiogenic agent, immunotherapy, antibody drug conjugates, and combination trials for ovarian cancer in the United States and internationally. It's been my privilege to be able to work with her on some of these uh, great projects. She's the chair of the Gynecologic Cancer Subcommittee of the National Cancer Institute Cooperative Group Alliance, and as a member of the NCI Gynecologic Cancer Steering Committee. She's an associate editor of Gynecologic Oncology, the journal Gynecologic Oncology. She's received the Dana-Farber Dennis Thompson Compassionate Care Scholar Award, the Lee M. Nadler Extra Mile Award, the Clarity Foundation Award, the Zakim Award at Dana-Farber for Patient Advocacy, the Albany Medical College Alumni Association Distinguished Alumna Award in, 19, or in 2022, and the Rosalind Franklin Prize for Excellence in Ovarian Cancer Research from the Ovarian Cancer Research Alliance. After receiving her MD from Albany Medical College, she completed an internship and residency at the University of Pittsburgh followed by Medical Oncology Fellowship at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston. To help um, moderate the Q&A discussions, I'll be here, and we'll try to feed you questions and direct them from the audience. Um, Althina will show the Zoom questions, so I'll be able to, to read them. And we thank very much Dr. Madalonis for being here today for our series, and we look forward to seeing you uh, later uh, at the next one, too. So, Ursula, join us. Please give a big hand. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I want to thank Jonathan um, for that lovely introduction and hospitality. Um, to Steve um, and to Oliver and everyone I've met with today. It's been really a pleasure. It's my first time at Stanford. Um, I've grown up on the East Coast. I grew up on Long Island, right outside of New York City, and then have done all my training and obviously work on the East Coast. So it's a nice change to come and see um, such a lovely environment, nice people, blue skies. Um, so again, thank you so much. Um, so I'm going to talk today about ovarian cancer, um, which is something that um, I've been interested in 
for several decades now um, and have seen the field change dramatically, um, seen patient care change dramatically, um, and still we have a lot of work to do. I think that's still the bottom line. Um, so these are my disclosures. Um, and then the agenda is really to talk about ovarian cancer, a little bit of the biology, clinical presentation, um, kind of get us to where we are right now in terms of therapeutics, um, talk about the different treatment paradigms for platinum resistance, platinum sensitivity, and also patients who are newly diagnosed. Um, and then they also talk about the unique characteristics of ovarian cancer that really um, lead to treatment you know, ease, but also um, some challenges as well. And then where we're going in terms of next steps. So this is ovarian cancer 2023, um, a little under 20,000 new cases per year in the United States. And that incidence has been very slowly but consistently dropping per year. Um, the estimated deaths, a little over 13,000 uh, per year. Um, that actually ticked up a little bit um, uh, for this year. It had been a little bit lower in the past. And survival is over improving. Um, and we can see that through here. Cases are dropping. Um, uh, death rates dropping. Um, the survival is increasing. And it really shows that you know, there are a lot of women in the United States who are living with this disease. So the prevalence is just under 250,000 patients living with ovarian cancer and existing with it. So um, again, a lot of uh, thought about how best to treat these uh, patients, and obviously then worldwide as well. <clears throat> I think it's also important to know that about half the patients who are living with ovarian cancer above the age of 65 but there are also a significant number um, who are younger ages as well. So this is a typical CAT scan on the left of what um, Jonathan, Oliver, and I see um, nearly every day are patients who come in um, just with advanced disease, and that's how high-grade serous ovarian cancer typically presents. That's the most common histology. I'll talk about other histologies as well, but basically ascites within the abdomen, um, and then the way that this cancer spreads intra-abdominally um, with nodules uh, that are present uh, uh, overlaying and on, on the intestines, um, and then sometimes a pelvic mass where the, where the ovary mass starts with a fallopian. We think that the, a lot of high-grade serous ovarian cancer starts in the fallopian tubes um, and then spreads um, really uh, surreptitiously within the abdomen prior to detection. Um, and then, so this is management in 2023. We know that surgery by gynecologic oncologists, so folks like Jonathan and uh, Oliver, um, are, are, that's where we make our patients do the best. They have the best outcomes because they're, they're surgically trained to, to treat patients in terms of surgery. Um, and multiple randomized trials have shown the equivalency of either upfront surgery um, versus making a diagnosis, giving that patient chemotherapy, i.e. neoadjuvant chemotherapy, followed by interval surgery, and then followed by more chemotherapy. However, studies like ICON-8 um, show that for patients who can go to upfront surgery, they do better. Um, so that's why it's imperative um, that a trained guide onc uh, see the patient uh, up front. The standard of care in terms of chemotherapy is carboplatinum plus paclitaxel, um, typically for six cycles given intravenously. Um, different medications have been added to that backbone, such as a drug bevacizumab, which is an antibody to uh, vascular endothelial growth factor. Um, that trial or that um, drug was FDA approved to be added to chemotherapy and then used as maintenance. Uh, in 2018, it improves progression-free survival, so how long the cancer stays in remission for, but it does not improve overall survival. And there have been multiple trials over the past decade or two testing other tyrosine kinase inhibitors like sidereneb, tribanenib, et cetera, um, both added to chemotherapy and then used as maintenance that have not made any inroads, either too toxic um, or just haven't been clinically significant in terms of, of outcomes. We've definitely moved to histology-based treatment. Um, those different histologies, which I'll talk about today, have different underlying genetic underpinnings. Um, so there's some overlap, 
Um, but uh, we definitely think about high-grade serosystology different than low-grade cyst uh, serosystology, and that's different, um, you know, in the past where it would just be a trial of ovarian cancer. Now the eligibility will state the specific histologies. And what's really important um, is that because of the incidence of BRCA mutations in our patients, um, that all patients, regardless of histology, age, family history, stage, undergo germline genetic testing. And that's really become ingrained in how we work up patients while they're getting their chemotherapy for upfront newly diagnosed advanced disease or not advanced disease. Um, that they undergo germline genetic testing. We also do, I also do somatic testing as well. We have a profile at Dana-Farber called Oncopanel, um, and I just order that, it's called Clinical Oncopanel, and I get a very good um, somatic report that gives not only mutations, but copy number changes, um, et cetera. It also now gives um, level of mismatch repair proficiency or deficiency. Um, and then also homologous recombination deficiency, and that's listed here. HRD testing is really important to help us determine whether or not a PARP inhibitor should be used up front or not, um, and then also to help the patient understand how much a PARP inhibitor is going to help her clinically. The test that is used um, that in clinical trials for PARP inhibitor is the myriad HRD score, which is comprised of LOH, or loss of heterozygosity, telomeric allele, allelic imbalance, and then large-scale state transitions. Um, there are other different foundation medicine, only looks at LOH, so there are different um, permutations of the HRD, and they also sometimes can get different results if you do different tests. Um, I tend to stick with the um, myriad HRD because it's the, te it's the um, test that's been embedded in PARP inhibitor trials. So this is a diagram that um, just happened, the paper just came out online in Nature Medicine. Uh, my colleague Panos and I just wrote this um, review on ovarian cancer drug development. And today I'm gonna really talk about high-grade serous ovarian cancer, um, which has you know, a, diff a, much, a multitude of different genetic abnormalities, um, obviously including HRD, BRCA, um, but also cyclin E amplification in a certain number of cases, which really portends chemotherapy insensitivity, um, abnormalities of the PI3 kinase pathway, um, et cetera. Um, and then also uh, talk about low-grade serous because that's really emerging as a histology that we have a different set of medications for to treat. So high-grade serous ovarian cancer, as I mentioned, is the most common histologic subtype of ovarian cancer. accounts for probably 75% or so of all the patients that we see with newly diagnosed ovarian cancer. As shown by those slides before with a scan that showed, you know, just ascites, most patients will, dis will present with abdominal distension, pain, sometimes nausea, vomiting, especially if they're on their way to a partial bowel obstruction. Um, and the cancer spreads throughout the abdominal cavity prior to detection, and to date there is no early detection test uh, for ovarian cancer. 22% of cases of high-grade serous will have an underlying uh, deleterious BRC mutation, either BRCA1 or 2. Um, most of those are germline, but some can be somatic, and hence the importance of doing uh, somatic testing. When we find a deleterious BRCA mutation, regardless if it's germline or somatic, it behaves the same way. Um, so patients derive the same benefit from drugs like platinum um, and also uh, PARP inhibitors. 50% of high-grade serous cancers have some underlying homologous recombination deficiency, and that can be from, obviously, an underlying BRCA mutation, but also um, different genetic abnormalities that would lead to uh, kind of that uh, presence of HRD. And that's really, you know, you can define it based upon those tests, but we can also define it based upon responsiveness to drugs like platinum. The genomics of high-grade serous are also exemplified by high copy number changes. And to date, those haven't been able to be uh, targeted, but you'll see pages and pages. Foundation Medicine doesn't really do this, um, but when we order Oncopanel at Dana-Farber, it lists all of the copy number changes, and it's really uh, quite incredible. Um, there's low, low tumor mutational burden, and hence uh, very, very low activity to drugs like checkpoint inhibitors. 
This is a typical patient, 65-year-old patient of mine. Um, she presented with four weeks of abdominal bloating and abdominal distension. CAT scan showed ascites, which are by the arrows in the upper left uh, CT, and then also diffuse peritoneal carcinomatosis. Her CA125 blood test, um, which is a marker that we use to um, really follow patients on chemotherapy, um, was over 2,000. Normal should be less than 34. She went to surgery in 2019 and was found to have high-grade serous ovarian cancer advanced stage with involvement of the omentum. It was an omental cake. Basically, the entire omentum was caked with tumor. Diffuse peritoneal metastases, um, involvement of cancer in the appendix, and both ovaries were involved with cancer as well. And genetic testing done during her initial chemotherapy showed an underlying deleterious BRAC mutation. She received six cycles of IV carboplatinum paclitaxel and had a complete response. So her CA125 normalized and her CT scans all returned to normal. She felt great. Um, and then she went on two years of Olaparib, which is an oral PARP inhibitor. Um, and she's been disease free uh, for the past uh, year and a half. So the trial, oh, I mean, a word about PARP inhibitors. Um, I talked a lot about PARP inhibitors today with um, some of the folks I met with. Um, these are drugs that have been around for a while. We started testing them um, almost two decades ago. Their two main functions of action are to inhibit function of PARP, which is obviously involved in single-strand DNA break repair, but also um, PARP trapping um, and trapping um, uh, PARP onto the DNA, um, not allowing eventual double-strand breaks to, uh, to be repaired. In the middle are the three PARP inhibitors that were used in ovarian cancer, rucaparib, olaparib, and niraparib. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, I was sitting at a, an ASCO meeting, an American Society of Clinical Oncology meeting in 2008. Um, and really, when I saw these um, CTs, this was a, a New England Journal of Medicine article um, by the English group, got published about a year later. But seeing these scans and seeing the level of activity that a drug like olaparib can have on BRC mutated ovarian cancer. That's, I, it was actually a, 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 not a great time in drug development. We just basically had chemotherapy, um, kind of making that switch from cisplatinum over to carboplatinum, um, and we had very few drugs available. So um, that got me very interested in this um, class of drugs. PARP inhibitors um, were tested in multiple different ways either comparing a PARP inhibitor to chemotherapy, adding a PARP inhibitor to chemotherapy, or in this trial design, which really came out to be the way that PARP inhibitors developed in both the upfront setting and in the platinum-sensitive recurrence setting, is using the drug as maintenance. So basically distilling a group of patients who are gonna have a great response to platinum, so high-grade serous, so they have underlying HRD, they're platinum-sensitive, and they're in response to platinum, and the PARP inhibitor is being used to maintain that response. Um, and the trials are basically randomization to PARP inhibitor versus placebo. Um, these are typically double-blinded studies that were done, um, with the primary endpoint being progression-free survival, so not overall survival. Um, and one issue that's come up with the FDA and, and interpreting these trials is that the drugs get approved based upon progression-free survival, but the FDA now wants to see the overall survival results. So the studies are not powered for overall survival. Sometimes there's missing data. You can't really control for what patients receive once they progress on the PARP inhibitor. So that's complicated things, and I'll, uh, I'll talk about that. So SOLO-1 is a trial that established the use of a PARP inhibitor in the upfront setting. Specifically, this trial only um, enrolled patients with underlying BRCA mutations, either somatic or germline, um, advanced cancer, received upfront uh, chemotherapy following surgery, um, were in response to chemotherapy, and then two-to-one randomization, either a laparib, 300 milligrams a day, versus placebo. And the trial limited the duration of the PARP inhibitor to two years, and that's actually key because, um, as we'll talk about, one of the long-term side effects of PARP inhibitors can be uh, acute myelogenous leukemia or myelodysplastic syndrome, and the primary endpoint is investigator-assessed progression-free survival. 
And these are the results when we saw these a number of years ago. I think everyone was super excited and still continues to be super excited. This has definitely become standard of care. Um, you can really see the significant improvement in progression-free survival, which is sustained even when the patient stops the PARP inhibitor. Um, and remember, this is a patient population we used to think of as being our best patients, um, underlying BRCA mutations in response to platinum. But you can see that only about 20% of those patients remain uh, disease-free. So the median PFS, 56 months for patients receiving the PARP inhibitor versus 13.8 uh, receiving um, uh, placebo. And important to make sure that that PFS lines up with OS, even though the trials were not necessarily designed to look at OS, but the FDA is looking at this, um, that, the, that the OS benefit also follows the progression free survival. So you can see that the median OS is in the right direction um, for patients receiving the PARP inhibitor compared to uh, placebo. There have been two other trials that have tested PARP inhibitors in the upfront setting. Um, one is the Paola 1 trial, which adds a lab rib to bevacizumab. So if you use bevacizumab, you're a bevacizumab uh, user in the upfront setting. Um, Patients could come on this trial as long as they had some use of bevacizumab in the upfront setting. Um, and in the maintenance setting, a laprib was added to, uh, to bevacizumab versus bevalone. And I should mention that because of the bone marrow suppression of PARP inhibitors, um, that makes adding it to chemotherapy uh, pretty prohibitive because of the overlapping uh, bone marrow toxicities. And then the second trial at the bottom is called the PRIMA study. That simply looks at the PARP inhibitor niraparib versus placebo. Um, and patients now, unlike SOLO1, which was confined to BRCA-mutated uh, patients, BRCA-mutated cancers, here you could have BRCA mutation or BRCA wild type, HRD, or homologous recombination proficient based upon the myriad test. Um, the duration of all laparib trials up front are two years. For niraparib, it's three years. Again, relatively arbitrarily selected. Um, and in the results and leading to FDA outcomes, in the PALA trial, when a lap rib is added to BEV, it really shows a progression-free survival improvement for patients with an underlying BRCA mutation or HRD. So they can have homologous recombination deficiency um, within their tumor, but also be BRCA wild type. If the tumor was HRP, BRCA wild type, the PFS, was, there, was no, um, there was no benefit. And in the overall survival, um, OS trended in the correct direction for BRCA mutated HRD, but not for HRP, the um, trended for placebo. So, hence, the FDA gave approvals for BRCA and HRD, not HRP. In the PRIMA study, um, we don't have overall survival results yet, but the PFS all trended even in the HRP towards the PARP inhibitor, so the FDA has granted. Um, um, approval regardless of BRCA status or HRD status for niraparib. That may change once we see survival, but we don't have any survival yet. Um, immunotherapy is, a, a, you know, there is, because of that low tumor mutational burden of patients with high-grade serous ovarian cancer, to date, there has not been a trial um, showing any benefit of adding a checkpoint inhibitor. These two trials um, are adding checkpoint inhibitors in the upfront setting. So the Javelin 100 study added a Valumab, anti-PD-L1 drug, um, and then the Imagine 50 trial added tezolizumab, um, both to chemotherapy and then extending that in the maintenance setting. Um, there was no benefit uh, PFS. Uh, actually, PFS was a little bit worse for the um, Valumab uh, group and the Javelin 100 really did not make any change for Imagine 50. At the bottom of this slide, um, I did point out at ASCO just a few weeks ago, um, there's a trial called Duo O, um, and that is a triplet of a lap rib, bevacizumab, and durvalumab maintenance. Um, and it was compared to Bev alone or Bev durvalumab. The trial did not uh, have an arm of Bev a rib. So um, another problem that happens, another challenge is that once trials are designed, that as they're being executed, standard of care changes. Uh, and the Paola 1 trial really showed that bevilaparib is a very significant arm in treatment. Um, so that 
you know, we'll have to see. We, that's not in print yet. We don't see OS results, et cetera. So um, right now, that has not changed uh, clinical care at all. A few words about low-grade serous ovarian cancer um, has the presence of the estrogen receptor and the progesterone receptor, along with um, the MAP kinase pathway is also um, uh, changed and altered there as well. We know that hormonal therapy in low-grade serous uh, ovarian cancer has efficacy, specifically aromatase inhibitors. This was shown by the MD Anderson group that in the upfront maintenance setting, um, that the use of an aromatase inhibitor compared to no aromatase inhibitor um, yielded uh, improved progression-free survival. And there's now a trial called NRG-GY019, which is actually testing upfront letrozole, the aromatase inhibitor, versus chemotherapy, then an aromatase inhibitor um, as maintenance, really potentially taking away chemotherapy in this cancer. Um, Low-grade serous cancer tends to affect younger patients um, and is not as uh, chemotherapy sensitive. So a very good trial, which is ongoing right now. In terms of recurrent ovarian cancer, um, many of our patients will recur. I think the use of upfront PARP inhibitors, especially in the BRCA mutated ovarian cancer patient, has, has probably cured some of our patients who wouldn't have otherwise be cured, but still, um, many of our patients do uh, recur. We detect that recurrence based upon the CA125 changes in the CM25, sometimes subtle changes in the CA125. And then the recurrence is defined by the interval between platinum and first evidence of recurrence. Um, platinum resistant is uh, within six months. Platinum sensitive means that it recurrence more than six months following last platinum. And then platinum refractory really means that the, pa the patient's cancer is growing on platinum, where platinum is just not uh, really an option. And the FDA approved treatments, which we'll talk about, is chemotherapy, plus or minus bevacizumab, the anti-VEGF uh, uh, antibody, PARP inhibitors, uh, and then now antibody drug conjugates. So platinum sensitive ovarian cancer, um, reuse of a platinum is really considered standard of care. Um, and the two trials called the OCEAN study and GOG213 led to the approval uh, in the United States of addition of bevacizumab to platinum-based chemotherapy for our patients with platinum sensitive disease. Um, and the first trial to report out, so there have been several trials I already mentioned a couple of trials in the upfront setting, but the first trial to report out, just reported out recently, just a few days ago, um, and that's called the Atlante NGOT trial, um, basically adding atezolizumab to upfront chemotherapy along with bevacizumab and then continuing that as maintenance. Um, and that unfortunately was also a negative study. Um, so again, another, another negative trial of adding checkpoint inhibition to upfront uh, chemotherapy, and then now chemotherapy in the platinum-sensitive recurrent setting. Um, we deal with carboplatin allergies um, up to 20% of time. Um, I just saw a patient the other day who actually anaphylaxed and coded um, when she received platinum. So they can be pretty, pretty dangerous um, allergies. Um, there are desensitization protocols available, but this is a problem that we have to just remind our patients about. Our nurses are very good and have code carts uh, pretty close by. Um, there have been three trials of looking at PARP inhibitor maintenance in the platinum-sensitive setting. Nova looked at niraparib, uh, Aero 3 looked at rucaparib, and Solo 2 looked at alaparib. Um, and all of these studies led to approvals um, of the use of a PARP inhibitor regardless of BRCA status, HRD status in the platinum sensitive setting if the patient was in response to platinum. And that was 2017 for niraparib and alaparib and 2018 uh, for rucaparib. However, last year, lots of changes. So I presented this data at SGO in 2021. And basically, this was now overall survival data for the NOVA study, and that's looking at niraparib as maintenance in the platinum-sensitive recurrence setting. So in the germline BRCA, that's the top curve, um, that's good. The PARP inhibitor is actually showing a trend towards uh, an improved OS. But the bottom, um, the hazard ratio is going in the wrong direction, 1.1, um, in favor of the placebo versus uh, the PARP inhibitor. So that really didn't make much of a splash, 
Um, just we said, well, maybe, maybe we need more data. Eventually, the FDA saw this and said, basically, you've got to get the uh, uh, extra data because there was a lot of missing data. Because once patients came off the trial, they were not followed for survival, so we did have some missing data. Um, and then I presented updated data um, in 2023 at Society of Gynecologic Oncology, um, and things uh, looked uh, about the same. So again, a benefit for trend for OS for germline, but for non-germline bracket at the bottom, um, the hazard ratio was 1.06, again, trending towards uh, placebo. And again, you know, in fairness, these trials were not powered for survival. Still, you can't control where patients, what they did once they came off the trial. Um, but what ended up happening, oh, and this, this is more data. So um, we looked at the, specifically within that non-germline bracket group, the two on the left, the HRD, um, and then the HRP. And the HRD group is really where we saw a trend definitely in the wrong direction uh, for niraparib. So if you could see that the OS, median OS for niraparib was 35 months and for placebo was 41 months. Um, and this led to um, uh, GSK voluntarily withdrawing with pressure from the FDA, um, withdrawing the non-germline or non-BRCA mutated uh, uh, indication. Um, and then for Ariel 3 and Rucaparib, Rob Cohen presented this data at IGCS last year. And again, you see very similar trends um, that OS is not going in the right direction. And this trial, this data led to, again, the voluntary withdrawal of Rucaparib for patients with um, BRCA wild type ovarian cancer in the platinum sensitive setting. Um, you know, in the United States, it's really not as much of an issue because we're using PARP inhibitors more up front. Um, but in other parts of the world where they don't have an indication, they are using um, PARP inhibitors in the recurrent setting. And the EMA approvals have actually not changed. So if you see a patient from an international, it's sometimes hard to explain to them the discrepancy um, in the um, uh, differences in approvals. Um, I think other long-term risks of PARP inhibitors, uh, development of drug resistance, um, we're maybe seeing a hint of this in the platinum sensitive recurrence setting. Um, I'll explain more data here. Um, and then also long-term toxicity is of myelodysplastic syndrome and acute myelogenous leukemia. So backtrack many years ago, um, where PARP inhibitors first received their FDA approval for ovarian cancer. And that was in 2014, after a rather not great ODAC meeting at the FDA, we're trying to get study 19 approved. This was a randomized phase two study, um, and it was voted down in the platinum sensitive recurrence setting. But the FDA ended up um, approving uh, Alaprib as treatment based upon um, data from a smallish phase two study showing a response rate above 30% uh, in a duration of response of almost eight months in the BRCA mutated setting. So that's how PARP inhibitors first got their FDA approval, 2014, as treatment. Um, and then Recaparib showed good results and Niraparib. So all three of those drugs were also approved as treatment. Just like you're gonna give chemotherapy, we can give a PARP inhibitor, but in the BRCA mutated setting. However, uh, at ESMO in 2022, Ariel 4 was presented, um, and this was a trial of chemotherapy versus a PARP inhibitor in the both platinum-resistant and platinum-sensitive setting, um, showing that overall survival was going in the positive direction of chemotherapy versus the PARP inhibitor. Um, and also a trial called SOLO3, which was non-platinum-based chemotherapy versus a PARP inhibitor in BRCA-mutated ovarian cancer. In that red box, these are patients who had received three or more prior lines. Um, the overall survival for a lap was 29.9 months. For chemotherapy, was 39 months. Um, so um, both of these trials led to the withdrawal of PARP inhibitors as treatment. And again, showing that perhaps PARP inhibitors are just not as good as chemotherapy and maybe setting up some uh, resistance mechanisms. This is the risk of AML and MDS. Um, on the left box are upfront studies. So what I quote patients for 
a risk of AML MDS for either two or three years of PARP inhibitor use is just a little bit below 2%. So SOLO1 showed 1.5%, um, and the PALA1 trial showed 1.7%. You can still get um, AML or MDS, unfortunately, uh, without the use of a PARP inhibitor, since chemotherapy platinum-based drugs still have a slight risk of a secondary leukemia. However, in the platinum-sensitive recurrence setting, um, SOLO2, I remember seeing these results a few years ago and just being astounded that if you have an underlying BRCA mutation and you receive a PARP inhibitor, um, and the PARP inhibitor here is not given for a limited duration, it's given for an unlimited duration, either until disease progression or toxicities, um, the risk is 8% um, compared to 4% if for patients who did not receive a PARP inhibitor. In the NOVA study, we really replicated that and showed about a 6.6% risk of AML and MDS in a germline BRCA mutation uh, patient who gets a niraparib. And then in Arial 3, um, if the PARP inhibitor was given for more than two years and there was an underlying BRCA mutation, those patients had a risk of 15.2% risk of AML and MDS. So it really has to be a toxicity that we talk about uh, with our patients. Most patients will say, look, you know what, I've got advanced ovarian cancer, um, I'm going to accept these risks, but it's just really important because it definitely, it definitely occurs. Moving on to platinum-resistant high-grade serous ovarian cancer, um, we've talked a number of conversations today about under, uh, understanding the underlying mechanisms for platinum resistance, and they're not really well understood. In 2014, and that was really the first drug approved um, for uh, platinum-resistant ovarian cancer was the addition of bevacizumab to non-platinum-based chemotherapy. And you can see from that box that the weekly paclitaxel bevacizumab is a very active regimen for our patients um, with a very high response rate and a very high um, level of progression-free survival. Um, and at the bottom is really, again, this insensitivity to immunotherapy. Um, the bottom with the red box is Keynote 100, 8% um, response rate of use of single-agent pembrolizumab in the uh, recurrent setting. Um, there's a paper now that's been submitted to Gynonc looking at trying to figure out different biomarkers, um, but it's, it's hard to find certain biomarkers um, to predict which patients are going to respond to immunotherapy. Um, and also, randomized phase 3 studies um, in the platinum resistance setting um, have not shown benefits. So this is a trial, Javelin 200, um, that added a valumab to pegylated liposomal doxorubicin. No benefit of adding the anti-PDL1 uh, to chemotherapy here. And then the NINJA trial, phase 3 study done in Japan for patients who are platinum resistant, um, really not heavily pretreated. They were randomized to either nivolumab or chemotherapy, and that chemotherapy was either gemcitabine or pegylated liposomal doxorubicin. And you can see on the uh, right-hand side, the primary endpoint of this trial was overall survival. Um, it was actually worse for the immunotherapy, 10.1 months for nivolumab, 12 months for chemotherapy. Median progression-free survival also was in favor of chemotherapy versus immunotherapy, and overall response rate was non-significantly lower in immunotherapy compared to chemotherapy. So really, we should not be using these drugs um, for ovarian cancer, unless you happen to find a patient whose somatic testing show that she has microsatellite instable disease. That's not usually high-grade serous, but that's typically low-grade endometrioid tumors, maybe mucinous, or maybe clear cell. So a little bit about PARP inhibitor combinations, and I know we've, again, m many of us have talked about PARP inhibitor conversations. This is taken from the Review of Nature Medicine, um, not Nature Medicine, Nature Cancer, um, recently. And the reason that we did a lot of PARP inhibitor combinations is was really to try to reverse either acquired or innate PARP inhibitor resistance. So um, a lot of preclinical studies um, showing the benefit of adding a PARP inhibitor, adding another drug to a PARP inhibitor to try to reverse underlying PARP inhibitor resistance. Um, so Joyce Liu in my group, um, this was her first clinical trial when she was a fellow. Um, she did this through CTEP, and this was basically adding sidirinib, which is a uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitor, VEGF1, 2, and 3 inhibitor, 
with a lab rib. We didn't have a lot of preclinical data, um, but uh, certainly there was phase two data showed pretty impressive response rates. Um, and this trial that was published in Lancet Oncology eventually led to two phase three trials. The one on the left um, was GY004 and platinum sensitive. So I snuck this in on the platinum uh, resistant true, but it should be in the platinum sensitive, but I figured I'd put everything together. Um, and this was a carboplatinum doublet versus a laprib versus a laprib plus And unfortunately, um, all three of those arms looked about the same. Um, it was not a non-inferiority study um, because they were really quite equivalent. So it was a negative study. Um, in the platinum resistance setting, Jungmin Lee at NCI is running this trial, and this is looking at the combination versus sidirinib versus non-platinum-based chemotherapy in the platinum resistance setting. And this trial has completed accrual, and we're just waiting for results. Um, PARP inhibitor combinations, specifically with PI3 kinase inhibitor. This is a, a, a combination that we tested in one of our original Stand Up to Cancer grants with Lou Cantley um, and Gordon Mills um, and my colleague, uh, colleagues at the Beth Israel. Um, uh, Dr. Wolf, Gerberg Wolf, showed nice preclinical data in both breast cancer as well as ovarian cancer, both in BRCA mutated as well as BRCA wild type, of the combination of a PI3 kinase inhibitor and a PARP inhibitor. So we did two phase one trials, first with BCAM120, which unfortunately caused a lot of central nervous system toxicity, so that drug was dropped. Um, and then Panos Constantinopoulos led a trial of alpelisib, BYL719 uh, plus a lap rib, showing good results. And this has led to an international phase three trial called EPIC-O. Um, it's completed accrual, and we anticipate um, results pretty shortly. Um, and then PARP inhibitor plus immunotherapy. Um, on the left, the results from Jean Zhao, who's one of our basic scientists at Dana-Farber, uh, and then Laia Ding, who's now at Roswell. She just got a, a job, a basic science job at Roswell Park, um, showing that PARP inhibition elicits the sting um, pathway um, and showed nice synergy in gem models um, in BRCA mutated ovarian cancer. Um, so that's led to a number of trials. So Panos um, led a trial of niraparib plus pembrolizumab um, that was published in Gem Oncology. A larger trial called Moonstone um, in solely platinum resistant ovarian cancer only showed a 7.5% uh, response rate of niraparib uh, plus pembrolizumab. So not, not particularly exciting results, and those did not move forward. Um, and then Joyce ran a trial called the OPAL study um, of a triplet of BEV, niraparib, and dostarlimab, um, an IO checkpoint inhibitor, um, showing a response rate of only 17.7%. So the response rates go up, but that actually response rate is pretty equivalent to single agent BEV in the platinum resistance setting. So um, there are other combinations. This is a trial that is from Roswell Park. Um, which was published in 2020. Um, it doesn't have any um, existence on the NCCN guidelines, so it's very hard to get, to get it paid for by insurance companies when we give it to our patients, but it's a combination of pembrolizumab plus BEV plus oral cyclophosphamide, um, showing a nearly 50% response rate. It was a mix of platinum-sensitive and platinum-resistant patients. So, um, you know, I think these are interesting results. Um, however, they really need to move forward in a kind of a phase three setting, um, and that's just not going to happen. So, um, and then I think a lot of these are additive. Uh, they're not necessarily synergistic in terms of the combinations. So moving on to antibody drug conjugates, um, a, a new type of medication tested in ovarian cancer. Um, I'm sure you know what ADCs are, but these are basically um, an antibody uh, linked to a drug or warhead not a great word, but a drug um, that targets a receptor. And the three receptors that have been looked at for ovary cancer thus far um, are folate receptor alpha, or FOLAR1, HER2, um, and then NAPI2B. Um, and the table on the right is taken from a nice review from Deb Richardson um, a few years ago. So mirvituximab um, is a, a folate receptor alpha targeted antibody drug conjugate um, and FOLAR1 has very limited expression 
on normal tissues. It has some expression on lung tissue, some expression on kidneys. Um, and the drug, the ADC, as I said, the FR-alpha directed antibody, a cleavable linker, and the drug is DM4, uh, which is a main tanzanoid uh, tubulin targeting agent. The drug to antibody ratio is 3.4, which is pretty reasonable. Um, lower, probably has less activity, higher, produces much more toxicities, and this is how many drugs are attached uh, to the antibody. Phase one testing, which we were participated in by, by 2012, um, so over a decade ago, and again, it shows you just how long drug development takes um, sometimes. Six milligrams per kilo um, was tested and selected as the recommended phase two dose. Lessons learned from 2012 until just recently. One is that when we use the regular body weight of patients, um, that led to increased toxicities, and those toxicities were ocular toxicities. So the DM4 hits the stem cells of the um, cornea um, and ca causes corneal microcysts. So patients can complain of blurred vision, transient, reversible, but they still can get it. Um, and the initial phase three trial of this drug called FORD1 um, used a different cutoff. So the cutoff was 50%, and it used a different way of scoring the folate receptor alpha using IHC. Um, so that was changed, um, and the cutoff was increased to 75%. And that led to the Soraya study. Um, the Soraya study um, is a patient trial of about 100 patients. It was a global trial. Um, and tested the six milligram per kilo dose of mervituximab in patients with platinum resistant high grade serous ovarian cancer who had received up to three prior lines of chemotherapy. And all patients, and this was mandated by the FDA, had to receive uh, prior bevacizumab. And the way that the tumor was assessed through IHC was that 75, at least 75% of the cancer cells had to stain at least two plus or higher. Um, based upon pathology. So that's how we, how we did the cutoff for the Soraya study. Um, and the next two slides show the results. The overall response rate as assessed by the investigator was 32.4%, and that there was also a blinded independent central review or bicker associated with this matched the investigator assessed response rates. And we had two predefined subgroups. So the number of prior lines of chemotherapy, one or two versus three, and then whether or not the patient had received a prior PARP inhibitor, that really did not influence the response rate. The response rate held up. And I think it's great that on the right, I see two-thirds of the patients um, experienced a response by the time of their third cycle. So if you, you're not waiting for a response, cycle five, six, patient's going to respond. Two-thirds of the time she responds um, after two cycles. The rest of the time, typically after four cycles. Um, the other endpoint that the FDA finds uh, really important for these single agent trials is the duration of response. So if you get a response, great, has to be confirmed, but how long is it? Should be at least six months here at 6.9 months. Um, and again, those two subgroup analyses did not have an impact. Um, and then this trial led to the um, accelerated approval uh, in November of 22 of mervituximab, basically for patients with ovarian cancer, platinum resistant, up to three prior lines, and had to have that 75% or higher uh, cutoff for folate receptor alpha expression. And the accelerated approval, which really was, was developed by the FDA back in 1992, um, this trial and the development of mervituximab hits a number of boxes. One, it's a high unmet need. Last drug approved was in 2014 using bevacizumab. The single agent study should contain at least 100 patients. We had 106 patients here. Um, and there should be a meaningful response rate and a meaningful duration of response. There should also be a sufficient database. And through Ford, one and other phase two trials, um, there was a really a large database that substantiated the toxicity profile plus this response. Um, and the confirmatory study should also be ongoing, and that's the Mirasol study, which I'll show you in a couple of seconds. Um, and the FDA went a step further, and this is actually in the, in the press release. Um, basically, they dipped into the data to make sure that the Mirasol study 
was going in the correct direction for mervatuximab versus chemotherapy. Um, it was done via an independent uh, data analysis, so they really made sure, did their due diligence besides, uh, before giving this drug an accelerated approval. The mirror cell study was presented by Katie Moore at ASCO just a few weeks ago. She had her own special session for this trial design. So again, this is mervatuximab, six milligrams per kilo. This is versus investigator's choice chemotherapy for patients with platinum-sensitive, high-grade serous ovarian cancer. The one difference is that there was not bevacizumab man mandated. Patients could have received prior bev or not received prior bevacizumab. Primary endpoint, again, was PFS by investigator. Um, orange line is MERV, blue line chemotherapy, clearly a progression-free survival benefit for mervatuximab versus chemotherapy. Overall response rate, 42% versus 16% for chemotherapy. Um, and we also saw some complete responses, much like we saw with uh, Soraya. And just, you know, overall survival, bet better. First time ever in a phase three trial uh, for platinum-resistant ovarian cancer that there was an OS benefit for the experimental th uh, therapy. Um, and there are multiple other trials ongoing of mervatuximab, both in the upfront setting um, combined with chemotherapy, this drug really does not cause significant myelospression, so it can be combined with chemotherapy and then used as maintenance. And I'm hurrying up because I realize, if we're, yeah. And there are many, many companies chasing the success of, of mervatuximab. Um, upafitinumab rizlodotin is a drug from Rusana. This is an antibody drug conjugate targeting NAPI2B, which is sodium ion uh, protein in the cell membrane. Um, we saw some initial presentation results of this in, at SGO in 2022. Um, they were still trying to figure out the dosing. I, our team participated in the phase one um, of this drug, so I, I've been involved in this um, from, from the start. Um, at the higher dose, there was a 15% risk of pneumonitis. Um, so we saw that the overall response was about 44%, duration of five months. So this led to three trials, um, all recently ongoing. Um, the uplift trial basically was looking at platinum-resistant cancer, up to four lines of prior treatment, um, and looking at uh, 36 milligrams, which was thought to be less toxic than the 43 milligrams per meter squared dose. Um, there was a press release of this data in July, uh, just a few weeks ago, um, showing relatively poor overall response rates. So in the top, this is the NAPI2B population, 15.6% um, response rate. Um, and then in the total population, 13% um, uh, response rate. So the entire program shut down. Um, and all of the uh, up retrials were, and if you go on the Mersana tr website, the drug is off their website. So, um, and the CEO unfortunately left the company a few a uh, few days ago. Um, DS eighty two hundred one A or trastuzumab deruxican, um, a drug that's been FDA approved for lung cancer, for breast cancer. This is a HER two directed therapy with a topo isomerase one um, uh, payload. Um, ASCO at 2023 presented the results of the Destiny Pan Tumor 2. We've participated in two other trials. My junior colleague Betsy Lee has a trial of Elaborate plus this drug. Um, we also have a phase one of um, Neratinib, which is another HER2 directed therapy plus this drug. So um, I've definitely had experience with this therapy. Um, th these are the results from ASCO. There was a basket trial. The red box shows you ovarian cancer, so platinum-resistant ovarian cancer, um, showing a response rate of 45%, um, which was matched by the blinded independent, independent central review and a very good duration of response of 11 months. These are the waterfall plots, um, all looking very good. Um, and then uh, this is looking at the differential responses based upon level of HER2 via IHC, 2 plus versus 3 plus, and the 2 plus do a little bit less well in terms of response rate than the 3 plus, but still very, very promising results. So I think this is definitely a real drug. My uh, colleague Bill Hahn, in a few weeks ago, a few months ago now, in a PNAS paper, really identified HER2 as a very targetable um, target in high grade serous ovarian cancer. Two trials, and I'm going to stop. Um, two trials that have just recently 
been reported out phase three trials in the platinum resistance setting um, that we've been waiting for. One is um, this drug called Batarexept, uh, or AVB500, which is a GAS6 axle inhibitor. Um, this trial design was weekly paclitaxel plus, we or weekly paclitaxel plus um, AVB500. Um, and unfortunately, um, there was not an improvement in PFS when you added the GAS6 axle inhibitor. Um, so that trial, lots of work, um, negative. Um, and then secondly, another trial we've been waiting for, these are these things called tumor treating fields. Um, basically, patients will put four electrodes onto their abdomen. Um, this is a therapy that's been shown to improve outcomes in brain tumors. Um, and this is weekly paclitaxel versus weekly paclitaxel plus uh, tumor treating fields and also a negative study um, looking at overall survival here as the primary endpoint, 11.9 months versus 12.2 months uh, for, the, um, uh, for the combination. So what's next? And I'm going to stop here. I have a few more slides, but I'm going to stop. So though challenging to date, um, it's definitely a very exciting time for ovarian cancer therapeutic development. A lot of people are working, and a lot of people here are working on ovarian cancer, which is great to see. It's really exciting to see that. Um, antibody drug conjugates are definitely going to be um, a drug moving forward because you don't have to worry about the genetic events that are happening. Um, these are targeting external proteins. Um, but the challenges are several, several including what we saw with um, UPRI about the toxicity versus efficacy, um, the level of target binding by the antibody, the heterogeneity of the target, and we see that clinically. We give an ADC to a patient. Maybe their lung mets shrink, but their mental disease grows. Um, the type of drug used, what's the payload? Is it an anti-mitotic agent? Is it a topoisomerase inhibitor? What's the sequencing? Um, and then uh, drug resistance mechanisms, which we don't really understand yet. Novel I IO drugs, again, another potential entire talk. Um, uh, Oliver is working on them. Uh, we have an NK cell preparation that we're working on. It's been tough to get it through the FDA, but we're working on that. Um, different DNA targets besides PARP, PARP1, Pol Theta. My colleague Alan DeAndre has worked on Pol Theta, has a Nova Biosyn trial ongoing right now. Um, and then targeting specific genetic events, RAS, huge right now, cyclin E1 amplification, et cetera. Um, and then histolic, histology specific developments. I'm just gonna present, I'm not gonna talk about the spore, but I'm gonna present this. Um, this is a drug from a local company in Boston called uh, Veristem, um, and it's a drug called avutametinib, which is a uh, RAF mech clamp, uh, plus a drug called a FAC inhibitor really showing quite exciting results in low-grade serous cancer, um, which has been very challenging to date. So I want to thank, uh, thank you all here for your incredible hospitality. Um, it's really is a lot to talk about. Um, I want to thank all my team, research team um, at Dana-Farber, and then particularly Alan, Joyce, Panos, Jeff Shapiro. The Belfer Center does all of our mouse work. Um, and then at the medical school, Joan Bruguet, who's been a great partner for the SPORE. Um, so thank you so much. Thanks, Lucia. It's an outstanding summary of where we are with ovarian cancer. Really beautiful. Thank you. Seven. Thank you. We have time for some questions. First of all, from the audience. Anybody? Oh, here we go. Excellent presentation. You didn't mention anything about using novel ways of early detection yeah. or following, like cell free tumor DNA, these multi early cancer detection uh, gallery type studies. What was your opinion? Yeah, about yeah, no, it's a really great question. It's really around early detection um, and some of these uh, platforms that are being tested right now. Um, I mean, I think to date there is just no, there's no early detection tests that we can reliably um, use for ovarian cancer. Um, you know, what's really important is for patients who have underlying germline BRAC mutations, that they're tested um, and that their family members are tested. And if the family members are found to have an underlying BRAC mutation, that they have risk-reducing surgeries. Um, 
lots of groups are working on early detection tests. My colleague Dipanjan Chowdhury and Kevin Elias um, working on a microRNA signature. Um, Kathy Burns, who's a pathologist at the Dana-Farber, who came up from Hopkins just a few years ago, um, was working on line one. I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of projects happening, um, but they're quite early and not quite ready for early. And I think, you know, Kevin and DePongen's pro project is really around in, in focusing on bracket carriers, high-risk carriers, um, figuring out which patients should have risk-reducing surgery, because you don't want to do risk-reducing surgery on a, on a young woman who hasn't, you know, had children yet. Um, so I think, but, but I think population-wise, you know, one in 80 uh, women will develop ovarian cancer. So it's not a particularly common disease. So, um, right. We're just starting at Dana-Farber a, um, a center for cancer prevention and interception. Um, and my colleague uh, Elizabeth Stover and Kevin Elias, who's one of our surgeons, will be, will be in that clinic and will be able hopefully to test some of these more novel early detection modalities, um, but nothing to date. Thank you so much. Other questions? Oh. Thank yeah. you. This is another excellent talk oh, of yours. You. Um, I wanted to ask you um, about DNA repair mechanisms on how we can potentially continue to think about this and target those. You know, there's a number of very interesting agents that target different aspects of the DNA repair pathway, including ATR inhibitors. So I, I'm just curious about your thoughts of combination yeah. POP inhibitors, ATR inhibitors. Yeah. You have an expert on ATR inhibitors, actually, who discovered ATR right behind you. Um, so um, you've got the expert in the world next to you. But yeah, you know, we've been working on, a, on, a, on one of the project one in our spore is a collaboration with Fiona Simpkins at Penn. Um, that's looking at ATR plus PARP, so Seralacertib plus Elaparib. And the problem has been, you know, that the trial is really defining a very sp specific eligibility. These are BRCA mutated patients who are progressing on a PARP and it's been very hard to accrue to. Um, but I agree, I think those, those still have promise. Um, but as we're moving away from PARP inhibitor use to other drugs, you know, patents expire, that kind of thing, unfortunately. Um, it's making it a little bit more challenging. But I agree, it's still a very active area and still, I think, very promising. Time for one more question. Uh, you said some of the combos have um, increased progression-free survival, but not overall survival. Yeah. What's the cause for that? Yeah, so I think, you know, I think it's potentially, you know, as I, as I mentioned, one is that it's not necessarily correct. Um, the FDA doesn't, you know, obviously um, think that way because still the numbers are going sometimes in the wrong direction. But, you know, the trials are not powered for survival. Um, we can't control what patients receive or don't receive. Um, these are worldwide trials, so they're not, again, there's not necessarily a specific treatment that's been decided, that we all decide that patients would receive post-PARP inhibitor therapy. Um, or perhaps, again, the concern is that the, the PARP inhibitor is inducing resistance to future drugs, um, such as platinum. And again, difficult to prove, but um, I think we have to take that notion seriously. Right, right, of course, absolutely. And there's crossover too, right. Right. I mean, survival is still survival, right? But but you're right for progression, right? Absolutely. But still, you and it's happened in the in the Nova study. I mean, this was that's a trial that Jonathan knows well because you were you were part of the trial. I mean, Jonathan is the first author on the on the weight and platelet uh, uh, paper. Um, if patients were on placebo, they basically randomized. We didn't know what they were on. They said, I want to be unblinded, which of course is totally, totally applicable, found that they were on placebo, and then went on another PARP inhibitor, or went on another PARP inhibitor trial, right. First, at the beginning you said that you do germline testing and somatic testing, I do. and gene testing. So how often do you find an actionable mutation that's pretty rare, or do you, is it? Yeah, so, so again, 22% um, of high-grade serous will have an underlying uh, BRCA mutation, 16% of those are germline, 6% are somatic. So I definitely will, f will find them. Um, 
Sometimes you'll find cyclin E1 amplification, HER2 mutations, RAS mutations. Um, so I, I will definitely find things that, you know, in the recurrent setting would be clinically act actionable. We have a question online from a patient who's watching who wants to know about Doxel. Doxel? Because her doctor is replacing Texel with Doxel for hmm. toxicity reasons. Yeah. That. Well, I mean, that sometimes we do that. I just, I just got an, an email. I think we just got an email that, that Doxel is under another shortage in some places, um, which is just hard to believe. Um, certainly, I mean, I think if it's, if it's, being, if it's being combined with carboplatinum, let's say, um, I think that's very reasonable to do, especially um, if you're having significant neuropathy um, or toxicities with, uh, with Taxol. Um, that's potentially reasonable to do. Good. Well, Ursula, thank you. This was wonderful. And thanks for coming all the way from Boston. Oh. Real pleasure to be here.